Hi, this is Dr. Cindy Woody. In this video, we're going to be talking about PASL Task 1 and beginning with the examples provided by PASL in the example of libraries. So here is our Task 1, Problem Solving in the Field. And you can see in the PASL library, Step 1 is identifying a problem or a challenge. Step 2, researching and developing a plan. Step 3, implementing the plan. And Step 4, reflecting on the plan and the resolution. So in the first video that we're making here, we're going to be talking about identifying the problem. So let's look at the plan first. So PASL recommends that you use this template to prepare yourself or to prepare your artifacts for the PASL exam. So it says you're going to use this template as your own personal rough draft. You do not have to use a specific form, but you do need to submit a two-page maximum draft of your plan for each of the tasks. So remember, this is actually important for you not only to prepare yourself mentally for the, the, the PASL, but also for your own purposes to be able to make a plan that can be submitted as an artifact. As you implement it, you will be making changes. Those changes do not have to be represented here. So I would begin by putting in PASL task number one, which is the one we're working on right now, and we're working on identifying the problem and the challenge. So this part isn't significant right now. We're also going to be looking at the rationale for the challenge or for the problem that you chose, intended results of your plan, the rationale for choosing the intended results for the plan, why is your new outcome important, results on the impact of student learning. We'll just go on down here, but for now, I want to get straight to the work. So this is the exemplar. If I had, remember we started here on this page, let me see, on this page with the exemplars, and you'll notice the little pathway here. I started with test takers, school leaders, building, submitting your task, and then I clicked on library of examples, and now I'm on task one. When I click here, this is what I get. So here's the library of examples for two students, one who performed well and met standards and one who did not. So let's look what it says here. One thing they did was they cautioned you, and I'm going to highlight it here so you can see what I'm talking about, that you can't submit other people's work for your own. And I know that may sound obvious, but here would be the possible mistake you might make here. Let's say that your principal has been working on a plan this year to improve, uh, we'll say, the first problem, first grade reading. You can't use the work the principal did and represent it as the work you did for your internship. The work you submit has to be work you actually led, work you actually did, work that's your own. You have to actually include your own written commentaries and student works and artifacts. Video recordings have to feature the things that you did or things that you supervised. So you, can you see the fine line there? I do understand how it could be confusing if you're working under a site supervisor who's working on a related problem. But if you try to submit their work, then that becomes cheating and you certainly don't want to be accused of something like that. So let's look at, before we start, at the bottom of each question, it shows the rubric. So it says, refer to the task one rubric for text box 1.1.1 and ask yourself these questions. You're looking for a significant problem. You're looking for the impact on instructional practice and student learning. So two things there, plus the significance of the problem. The collection of longitudinal data that supports the candidate's choice of a problem or challenge the anticipated results once the problem or challenge is addressed, how the change will impact instructional practice and student learning, and why the student's response is logical and appropriate. So let's look at the person who nailed it. Notice right here, this person met or exceeded standards. That's how you know. So take a moment to read what's on the screen. I really hate to read what's on the screen to you, so I'll give you just a second. Okay, so let's see the gist of it. This person selected first grade reading as the problem. And notice right off the bat, he or she has skipped to calling it, they want to have the students reading at reading level J by the end of first grade. Do I need to know what reading level J is? No, I happen to know because I did teach first grade. But this is, it's okay to let the, um, some of the details go because you're not going to have an unlimited number of characters and words. You have a certain number that you can write and you can't write and write and write. So you have to be careful have to have a concise answer. The problem I selected was a substantial number of first graders 
basically she says they were getting to the end of first grade and they were still learning to read and not able yet to read to learn. Do you see the difference? So she says that when they get to second grade, they should be able to read about things and learn, but instead they're still learning to read. And so she explains that's a big problem for her school. Does that sound like a big problem to you? So she says all of the students, well not all the students, a significant number of students are going to second grade not prepared and she's noticed that they're making very little, very little gain, very little progress. So something's got to change, right? And then she references in this paragraph Artifact 1.1.1. Now notice this is text box 1.1.1, which means that's where she's writing her answer in the PASL uh, submissions. And then she's going to put an artifact with it, Artifact 1.1.1, and she's going to talk about the artifact. So don't include any artifacts that you don't reference in your essay. It's important that you use evidence and you refer to the evidence in your discussion. So there she goes. We don't know what 1.1.1 really is yet. She says, as evidence from 1.1.1, first grade students made very little gains in reading throughout the year. But if I had the portfolio, I could obviously see that. But then she does go on and be and explains what that, came, what that came from. So she says here, after looking at the longitudinal data from our assessment wall, artifact 1.1.1, we could see that students in first grade were not making the necessary gains in the reading level in order to do well in second grade. Now notice this is not a teacher who's talking only about her class or his class. I would assume that this person may be a first grade teacher, but they might not be. They might be the campus um, PE teacher, or they might be maybe an um, academic coach of some sort. We don't know what this person's role is, but it doesn't matter. This person is conducting principal-like activities on a problem that, are, that is significantly affecting the entire campus. So back to this discussion here. So he or she is looking at the longitudinal data from the assessment wall and they can see that students in first grade were not making the necessary gains in order to do well in second grade. Then they back it up with data and they talk about what they're using to assess students' reading capabilities. They talk about the DRA, but they don't tell you what the DRA is. It says they were able to assess these things and they've studied these problems, they've looked at them, they found that the ones with lower reading levels could benefit from planned intervention. So they're moving now towards a solution. The second tool we used was the screening and progress monitoring tool that measures reading and math performance. It identified students at risk and allowed us to easily choose str students struggling in the area of comprehension for the reading intervention plan. And then they go on to say, if first grade reading students, if first grade students reading comprehension is addressed through the implementation of my plan, I anticipate struggling students will make greater strides in understanding their text as evidenced by, and then she explains. So this person has put together a nice big picture of this plan. So first, we'll just say she, first she says first graders across our school are leaving first grade below where they need to be in reading. It's impacting second grade. I've given you three years worth of data to prove that. And the long range problem is it continues to impact students and they struggle. And she says, so I think that we need to do this. I'm going to measure it by doing this. And I'm going to also use data from this. And I think in the end, we're going to find out this. And I think that all the teachers right here, I love this part. She says, my hope is that by sharing successful quantitative and anecdotal data with my colleagues, my intervention plan, which, allow, which features a lot of student choice and cross-curricular instruction and collaboration, will inspire other teachers to allow, see, she made a mistake here, to allow, implement, the same or similar intervention plans that thus creating a school environment in which students take ownership of their own learning and all teachers regardless of content area work together to help students achieve in the area of reading comprehension. So do you see a principal like focus? A big picture plan, she's talking about all the teachers taking ownership, she's talking about student learning and outcomes and success and I do understand why this one was scored at meets or exceeds. This person does sound like a person who understands how to find, address, and, and solve a problem using the input of teachers. Okay, so now let's look at the person who did not do as well. So same standards we're looking at. We're on text box 1.1.1, and they did not meet, or they only partially met standards level. So this person just goes straight to the point. The significant challenge I have found is math scores on the map have declined the last two years in fourth grade, 
the impact the problem has on instructional practices of student learning is a problem. So that's not really a very helpful sentence. She says the impact of the problem is a problem. She doesn't really tell you what the impact of the problem is. She just says it's a problem. Then she says students are taking needed time for review of content. Therefore, some needed content is not being taught. So I understand that. Any of you that have taught in the classroom very long know that when you get a group of students who are behind, they have to use some of the instructional time to go back for reteach, which cuts into your future time to reteach. And there, I mean, it's just a, it's a spiral. The decline has been over 10% over the last two years. Do you really understand, though, what the issue is? Think about the quality of the first response. So in the first response, the teacher talks about how why learning to read is important and why being able to read to learn is important and where that is impacting students and what it has looked like over the last few years and why in the long term this is a huge problem for their entire school. This one just says it's using up some of their time. It's not a really very convincing argument. And she says the decline has been over 10% for the last two years. It's kind of a vague statement. So this one isn't really showing the clarity that the other one showed. The longitudinal data I chose to use is the map. The assessment is designed to give a thorough evaluation of students' understanding of the material that is well-defined in Missouri Learning Standards. The data from the fourth grade math assessment shows an increase of 4%. This one just sort of wanders around. It's kind of bird walks. It never really draws the conclusions that we need to be able to talk about what happens with this data. And then she goes on to see, I anticipate the challenge of student achievement will be improved dynamically by the implementation of data-driven instruction. I think she does a little bit better on C. Teachers will start new units with a pretest over the materials to get a starting point for each individual student. Teachers will evaluate where student, each student is and then plan a course of action. But where does she really talk about how she's going to get teachers to do that? Do you see in the first one she talks about her goal is, let's go back to what this plan says. Remember this document here. Her problem was that she felt like math scores were low in fourth grade. And then her rationale for choosing this as the problem, she doesn't really explain. Let me go back. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. She doesn't really explain the rationale for choosing the problem other than to say math scores are going down and it's taken a lot of time. The intended results of the plan, she hopes that um, student achievement will go up dramatically and she hopes that teachers will start using new units. The rationale for choosing that, she does explain that a little bit. The resulting impact on student learning, she says, I anticipate student achievement to also increase with additional, uh, this additional instructional practice. Students using information will dramatically increase on their own, making them more capable learners. I feel that they'll go up 10% in the first year and 1% to 3% the following years. And then the evidence, the impact on student learning, colleagues needed for support, rationale for choosing them. She doesn't really talk about that. She just says teachers. So are we talking about fourth grade teachers? Are we talking about third grade teachers, fifth grade teachers? It kind of sounds like maybe she's just thinking through the lens of a fourth grade teacher. She doesn't really maybe have the grasp on the big picture of leading other people. All right, so let's look at the bottom. The last thing that the ETS people or the PASL people suggest is after using your own rough draft response, the guiding prompts, remember this is your rough draft paper, ask the question, which parts of these examples are closest to what I have written? Then read the four levels of the matching rubric labeled with your text box, with a text box number and decide which best matches your response. Use this information as you revise your own written commentary. So in this video, we've only really talked about planning and looking at the difference between a good and a bad example. So I'm going to stop for now and I'm going to make another video that talks a little bit more about the directions for, do you see where it shows the A, B, and C? How did they know to do that? How did they know to label this artifact 1.1? So we'll take a look at that in the next video. Thanks for sticking with me. Best wishes.